All right, so in this video, I'm going to take it using specific heat capacity, specific latent heat effusion of vaporization to explain what happens when we bring two different materials together, including dealing with them when there's a state change when we mix them as well. Um, but before we do that, just a couple of quick things on how to actually use this video to maximize the amount you learn from it. So I'm going to take you through a series of different scenarios and we're going to apply the concepts to those scenarios. So first thing is, with each of them, I'm going to give you a chance to have a go at the question before I go through it. And it is critical that you do, or otherwise you're not really going to get out of anything out of watching this video. Um, so it's critical that you go through that process. And the other thing is you need to make sure you know are familiar with the concepts so that you know what specific heat capacity is, you know what the latent heat of fusion and vaporization are, you know what thermal equilibrium means. Because if you don't know those things, again, watching this video is going to be a waste of time for you. And then finally, once we've been through some questions, pause the video and make sure you go back through and can explain every stage that you've gone through in your calculations because again if you can't do that you need to go through it again because that's the critical thing to be able to do okay so the general scenario is we've taken a lump of copper and we've put it in the flame for several minutes and we do that so the copper becomes the same temperature as the bunsen flame so the copper is in thermal equilibrium with the bunsen burner that's why we leave it there for several minutes. And then we put the copper into a beaker of water and we're gonna neglect, neglect any heat transfer to the beaker or to the surroundings. And we're gonna measure the temperature rise of the water. So that's how we're gonna go about finding the temperature of the Bunsen burner. And we've got some information about specific heat capacity. So using a thermometer, we'll measure the temperature rise of the water uh, from 15 to 35. And we'll go about working out the thermal energy gained by the water. So let's do that now. So before I show you how this is done, pause this video now and have a go at calculating the thermal energy gained by the water, and then we'll go through it. Okay, so um, first off, the equation I'm going to use is this one because we're not dealing with a state change, we're just dealing with a temperature rise. And just a little notation thing, if you see a delta T, it's final temperature minus the initial temperature, or TF minus TI, as you'll often see me write it. That's how we always calculate change. Then we can plug the numbers in. Uh, so we've been given the mass in kilograms and the specific heat capacity in joules per kilogram already. So that's fairly straightforward. And then because three of our numbers are two significant figures, uh, in fact, all of them are, we would give our answer as two significant figures, it's a thermal energy, so it's in joules. So that's how much thermal energy has been gained by the water, or internal energy, we might say as well. Okay, so that's our water. Now what we're gonna do is think about what that means for the copper. So what we're gonna have a go at now is explaining how much thermal energy the copper has lost. And again, assuming we haven't lost any thermal energy to the surroundings. So again, have a go at the, uh, explaining this and then I'll take you through my explanation. Okay, so now you've had a chance to write your own explanation. Let's take a look at mine. So the first thing is the total amount of thermal energy must be conserved. We haven't exchanged any heat with the surroundings. So we have figured out the water has gained thermal energy. So what that must mean is that the copper has, must have lost an equal amount of thermal energy. Or another way of expressing that is the sum of the changes in thermal energy should be zero. Um, so this relates quite strongly to the mechanical energy stuff you would have studied uh, as part of mechanics, where the, the principle of conservation of mechanical energy states that if there's no work done, the, the sum of the changes must be zero. This is the equivalent in thermal physics. So Water's gained 3.8 times 10 to the 4, so the copper must have lost 3.8 times 10 to the 4 if no energy has been exchanged with the surroundings. Okay, so then what we're going to do is try and figure out what the temperature change of the copper has been. So again, using the values we've already calculated, have a go at doing this. Calculate the final temperature, the fall in temperature of the copper, sorry. Okay, so let's take a look. So we know 
Again, we're going to be using this equation. We haven't got a state change going on. And we want the change in temperature. So that's going to be delta T. So we make that the subject. Then we've got our numbers. And I've put the unrounded value of Q in here. And we've got a change in temperature of minus 8.1 times 10 to 0, or 810 Kelvin. I think it's like 807, blah, 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 blah. And it's minus because it's falling. So that makes sense. OK, so this is how much the temperature of the copper decreases because you put it in the water. So then what we can do is think about what the temperature in the Bunsen burner is. So again, that's what I'd like you to have a go at now. We've got the fall in temperature when we put the copper in water. So what was the temperature of the copper when it was in the flame and therefore the Bunsen burner temperature? OK, so you've had a chance to have a go at that. So let's have a look. So first off, um, the final temperature that we've been given will be when the copper and water are in thermal equilibrium. So we know that's going to be the final temperature after the fall in temperature. So that's what we're going to use. So the final temperature minus the initial temperature must have been delta T. Uh, we know the final temperature is 35 degrees. We know the change in temperature is 807. So now what we want to do is calculate the initial temperature before we put it in the water. So that's rearranging the equation. And just plugging our numbers in tells us the Bunsen burner is at 8.4 times 10 to the 2 degrees or 840 degrees Celsius. OK, so that's one scenario where we're putting two materials at different temperatures together. Now we're going to start to look at state changes as well. OK, so let's have a look through this problem. So we've got... Uh, an insulated copper can of mass 20 grams and it's 50 grams of water inside it and they're at thermal equilibrium at 84 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to put another block of copper in it at a temperature of 990 degrees Celsius, so considerably hotter. And then what we're going to do is we're going to leave it and the final temperature reaches 100 degrees and some of the water will turn to steam because we're at the boiling point of water. And we've been given some information about the specific heats of capacity and vaporization of water because we're going from liquid to gas. So we need the vaporization. And the first thing we want to do is figure out how much thermal energy has been transferred from the copper block when it cools to 100 degrees Celsius. So it starts at 990, cools to 100. So pause the video, have a go at this question, then we'll go through my solution. All right, so now you've had a chance to have a go. So uh, we're going to be using Q because MC delta T. So the copper block is not changing state, so we can use that equation. Uh, we need to first convert into kilograms from grams, which you can see I've done. And then we've got our uh, um, temperature. So you can see here I've actually done it the other way around because we're calculating how much thermal energy goes to the the copper can and the water, which is why I put the final and the initial temperature the other way around to normal. So what this calculation tells us is that 16 kilojoules of energy are transferred from the copper block to the water in the copper can there. That's why I've done the temperature change the other way around. Then we want to know how much thermal energy is available to make steam. So again, have a go at that. You might need to rewind to have get some data from the question to so have a go at calculating how much thermal energy is available to make steam. OK, so now you've had a chance to have a go. Um, first off, we need to work out how much energy has been transferred to increase the temperature of the water and the can. So that's what you can see I've done there. I've turned each of the masses into kilograms, multiplied each of them by their own specific heat capacity and the temperature change. So we need this amount of energy to raise the temperature of the materials. So then the energy left to vaporize the water will be the difference between thermal energy transfer, so the 16,000, blah, 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 minus the, temp the energy to raise the temperature. That tells us much how much energy is available to change the state of the water from liquid to gas. OK, so then next part, it wants to actually calculate the mass of steam that can be produced. Um, so we know how much energy we've got. Now we want to find out the mass. So again, I'll 
pause the video now and have a look at calculating this. Okay, so we're dealing with state change, so we're going to be using the equation Q equals ML. We want mass, so we're going to make mass the subject. We're going to put the unrounded values in, and then what we're going to do is we've got a final answer, and I'm just going to convert that into grams because that's of the order of magnitude times 10 to the minus 3. So we would get 5.6 grams of steam popping out the end. Okay, so what we're going to do now is have a look at probably the most challenging kind of question you could get with uh, mixing two materials together. Um, so let's take you through it. So we've got a Coca-Cola drink of essentially 0.2 kilograms at 3 degrees Celsius, and it's poured into a glass beaker. The beaker has a mass of 0.25 kilograms, but is at 30 degrees to start with. So we've got quite a warm beaker to start off with. We've got specific heat capacities of both the coke and the glass, and you'll notice the coke is being modelled as water. So what we're going to try and do is find out the final temperature of the drink, and we'll show that it's about 8 degrees when it reaches thermal equilibrium with the beaker. Okay, so I've, you've been given some specific heat leak capacities and stuff because you're going to use those later on, but those aren't needed for us right now. So, first off, let's, I'll let you have a go at this question by applying the principles we've been using so far, and then I'll take you through it. So, have a go now. Okay, so, first off. The principle that we're going to be using. So we're going to ignore thermal energy exchange with the surroundings. And you might sometimes see that described as an adiabatic process. But all that means is the sum of the changes in thermal energy should be zero. So we're not getting an overall change. So then I'm going to create expressions for each of the uh, changes in the energy. Um, so we've got using, we just at the moment haven't got a state change, so we're just doing a temperature change. And the coke starts at 3 degrees and the glass, I've called it, starts at 30 degrees. Um, so those are expressions for change in thermal energy. And because we've done them the same way around, it doesn't matter that I flip the way it normally is. So you'd normally see it as TF minus 3 and TF minus 30, but because I flip both of them around, it doesn't change the equation in any way. So then what we can do is if we add those two changes together, it should be zero, or another way of writing it is what you can see here. And then once we've done that, we can rearrange to make the final temperature the subject, plug the numbers in, and once we've done that, you'll come out as 8.4 degrees, which is roughly 8 degrees. So we've got to the correct answer here. OK, so we've now got a cola drink and a glass beaker at 8.4 degrees. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to cool it down to 3 degrees by adding ice that is at 0 degrees. So this is why in the, the introduction, you were given the specific latent heat effusion of ice because this is where we're going to need it. Now, we want to know how much ice we need to eat, add to cause this temperature change. So pause the video now, go back and collect some data from the original slide if you need it, and have a go at working out the mass of ice that we need. OK, so let's go through this step by step. So first thing, we the thermal energy uh, supplied to the ice is going to be in two forms. We're going to need to supply thermal energy to melt it and then thermal energy to raise it to three degrees. But the cola and the beaker, we're going to need to take away thermal energy from to decrease their temperature to three degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to add those two together and make them equal to zero, which is the same as the expression that I've written there. And we're going to rearrange to make the mass of ice the subject of the formula, because that's what we want to calculate. And then once we've done that, we can just plug some numbers in, uh, making sure we get our signs correct and the getting the temperature change of the water the right way around. And we end up with a mass of ice of 0 
kilograms there. So that's how we'd approach solving it. And as you can see, I've kept it in algebraic form as long as I can and then substituted numbers in the end, which is a good habit to be in when you're doing these questions. OK, so that finishes this segment looking at mixing materials. Um, at this point, I highly recommend you go back through the working for each of these questions and ask yourself, can you explain why each of the stages have been done? And if you're happy with that, um, then that's good. Uh, you've finished this particular thing you're looking at here. If you can't for any of them, it's time to go back and go through those and find that information that you're looking for. So. Once you've done that, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment and let me know. I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for taking the time to watch.